Bedside means where you start the animal experimentation. Bedside means when you start doing clinical practice, clinical usage of that topic. So bedside to bedside. First of all, I would like to tell you that the person who did the first aortic valve is Alan Kribir. And he is one of those uh, no, not yet received the Nobel Prize, but uh, likely to receive Nobel, likely to be, has been already been nominated. Dr. Kribir at my residence, few memorial photographs before I go on to the topic, at my residence in Sarita Vihar. Then my son Chinmay, Dr. Kribir on bicycle. He's showing how to, this is 96, 97. Then this was one of the ESC meeting, and this is, uh, uh, these are in the cath lab, when I used to work with Alan Kribir in France, at the age of almost 30. At that time I worked with him, and uh, this is his young Dr. Alan Kribir, Dr. Kribir in one of the restaurants, myself, my wife, and Chinmay. And uh, then uh, this was the first actually Tavi case, Dr. Amit, you'll like no, first Indian patient. This is the first Indian patient operated in Rua, our case, referred by Dr. G.K. Mani to me. And this is Dr. Krivir who did the procedure in 2013, 13. At that time, India, sorry, 11, 2011. We started doing procedures in India in 2012. Because at that time, Edwards, neither Edward or Metronic valve was available. This was the first Indian case done in France by Alan Krivier and myself when I was in the cath lab. This is the cath lab of Hospital Charles Nicole Nua. This man is a big industrialist and, uh, and he lived for another seven years post valve, 40 minutes procedure, 40 minutes by watch in that time, 40 minutes, no general anesthesia. Patient was conscious all through. And within 40 minutes, Dr. Krivier finished his procedure of Edward Valve in front of my eyes, shifted to the ward, and then I'll show the few slides of these cases. So these were the important photographs, and this is the first case. So 20 years have been passed. So first case was done in 2002, April 16. I was not there because I came back to India at the time I was working in Apollo. I was there only 96 to 98. When he was thinking about it, he, did he was doing animal experimentation. So I was part of those experimentation, and I was part of his, those thought process, and the, the struggle which he had to go to do the first case. So this was actually the first case, April 16, 2002, first film means first in man, first in man case done, and we had a 20 year celebration this year in Rua in May 2022. 20 years passed the line, I was there, I was invited, and there were a lot of doctors, Dr. Martin Leon, Greg Stone, Fajade, the big, all big cardiologists of the interventional community were there to celebrate this event of 20 years in France. Dr. P. C. Rath from Hyderabad was there with me. Oh, incidentally, I was wearing the same coat which I'm wearing today, a different tie, okay. <laughs> so I see my younger son, Chaitan had gone. This is one of those chapel. Chapel means a big church where they, for example, they, in the big church, they have a huge banquet hall and they allow such ceremonies to happen, and this was done there. This is the old photograph, uh, Dr. Kribir and his wife, 97th, uh, perhaps, Chinmay, my son, myself, my wife. I have a wonderful stay with him. Dr. Kribir is not only a very big operator, but he's a he very, very nice human being. So this was the photograph which he shared during 20 years Tavi celebration. He's written in French. Eh? One of the photographs, when I was working in 97, he showed few photographs of few fellows who worked with him. So this, I took the photograph from him, from his uh, slideshow, which was going on during that evening celebration. Amit, you were not there. You would have come, you would have enjoyed the celebration, April, just before the Euro PCR, in May 2022. So this was the photograph which I took. I was so very happy to see, my, see myself in the, that program with Alan Krivier, which he had selected for the slideshow, which was going on during the evening celebration of 20 years of Tavi. So this is how he was there, in 20, physically present there, myself with the same coat and uh, my Chan, Chatan and Dr. Krivier on April, May, May 16, I think it was there, uh, 2022 20, in Rua in France, one of the chapelle. Uh, so let me introduce him also, he's a young man. He's the treating doctor of Dr. Krivier. Dr. Krivier had to undergo himself a stent implantation recently. And uh, so I met him, he said he was an emergency call it's very interesting because I will talk something different because people are speak, speaking science, but I would like to tell my experiences. So he said, 
that he was on call in a small city of France in south of France and Dr. Cribier was on vacation here at Chespain and here at Chespain he landed in emergency with him so he said he was telling his thought process young cardiologist treating a very senior cardiologist of France he said I came to know I got a call from phone that there's some Dr. Cribier in emergency triage he said he th said he I thought it should not be Professor Alan Cribier because he never wanted to treat him. A small, a now young cardiologist treating a very big man. So he said, no, I went to try and found that it was actually Alan Cribier. So I was shocked and I was very nervous to treat him. He did emergency angiography, angioplasty and stenting. So he was telling his story. So I took his story and uh, so he is a treating cardiologist to Dr. Alan Cribier. So we all doctors should be aware of their own coronaries. And Dr. Cribier was so, I would say, relaxed. When, when I told him, when did you have the blood pressure checked? Oh. Five years back, I am all right. I am fine. So that, that that, and he was traveling like anything. He's the most sought cardiologist all over the world. He, he must have traveled. I, when he did the first aortic valve plasty, the Ellen was telling that second home, Alan Cribier's second home was a plane. He was traveling so much at that time. So these are a few photographs of that. He, you know, this man Jean Fajade. He is a big cardiologist. He is a course director of Europe ECR. He was there to see, and he was not given a place on the stage. He was just an audience like me during the 20 years celebration. So that means I have very limited coats. I'm wearing the same coat which I was in morning. Raki, you have to find more coats for me because I wear the same coat everywhere. You see, uh, Amit, this was the coat I was wearing. So this is an interview I took him in Rua. Uh, it's on YouTube. I took a 20 minutes interview with Alan Krivier, uh, almost 15 minutes in a hospital gallery. And this is a very nice photograph, both of us laughing. Again, April, May 2022. So these are good, good photographs, uh, good place. He has been to my house. So let me tell you how it all started. I'll take another 10 minutes because we have a more lectures and then. So this is Dr. Briss Latak. He was the head of department and he was number two in France in Rua when I joined him in 96. So he's, this is the personal journey in 1976. Dr. Krive went to USA for a fellowship, 76, and then he came back. I want to tell him because this is the, how we know. So these are a few photographs and then I come to the presentation. Let us come to the presentation. I will speak in nominal language so that we have a, a Junaid, there are a few people outside sitting. Let them be inside. It's an important lecture. Or, or doesn't matter because it's being recorded. So, so what is the degenerative aortic stenosis? What is balloon aortic valvoplasty? How it made, did the film? And then I will show the case report and current indications. So, Degenerative aortic valve stenosis, in simple terms, aortic valve stenosis, stenosis of the aortic valve, is the most common acquired valvular disease in adults. 26% of the population above the age of 65 has mild, moderate, or severe aortic stenosis. 2% are symptomatic and should require treatment. It is estimated that within 15 years, the number of AS will nearly double. So this is how the aortic stenosis behave. Surgical, you have onset of severe symptoms, angina, syncope, failure. And after that, there is a very fast decline in the survival. Once a patient is diagnosed with aortic stenosis, if we don't treat, the patient will die soon because of heart failure and because of so many. That means it is something which is salvageable, treatable, life-saving procedure. Either you replace the valve with the aortic valve replacement or do TAVI. So that was surgical intervention should be per promptly performed once minor symptoms occur. In elderly ports, so what after successful valve replacement, patient lifespan returned to that of general population. 1985, going back again 10 years or 20 years before the first TAVI, at that time, the first aortic valvoplasty was done by Alan Cribier, September 1985. That time, mitral stenosis was being treated, but aortic stenosis, valvular treatment was almost impossible. Because once you inflate the balloon inside the aorta, the patient can crash on the table. You have to be very, very quick. You understand, all the interventional candidates will understand how difficult it is. The first case was 72 year old female and he, she was surgically declined and it was uh, done. And there was a memorable reaction to the medical community published in Lancet, January 11, 1986. He became hero after that. He did the first aortic valvuloplasty, 1986. And that time he was so much invited everywhere all over the world after this, uh, uh, this article in Lancet. Uh, that uh, sec I was told that his second home was actually a plane. So different type of balloon was used, but there was a limitation because the, once you do BAV, within few months it will recur. 
unlike mitral stenosis, where it has not recurred for many years. So it became an obsession for him to develop something where we can do surgically, non-surgically, treat the, and change the valve. So this was done by him. And uh, this was uh, 1986 balloon bomb effect. So this is uh, how you should do. I would show 1985 to 2002, it took almost 20 years for him to develop a TAVI. It became a personal obsession and personal thought process that if BAV does not work, let me do something which can be uh, non-surgically. It is always told that don't undertake a project unless it is manifestly important and nearly impossible. This is Edwin Land. He followed this. Don't undertake the project unless it is manifestly important. It should be very important, relevant and almost impossible. <laughs> this was something it was almost impossible. So he took this project and this without aortic stenosis season 2, the fame I told you 2002 he did the first in man implantation. In 1980s surgical aortic valve replacement was declined in all patients older than 70 years. 50% was symptomatic. So that was the reason why he took this effect. So come, how to, he developed it? Coming on to the hypothesis, developing TAVI was an unrealistic project. Implanting a valve proth processes, what is the physiology? You are implanting a valve processes within a calcified diseased aortic valve on the beating heart, on a beating heart using percutaneous catheter based technique without opening the chest. And the goal is to improve the results of BAV which is balloon aortic valve plastic, no risk stenosis. It's highly challenging. Why? Because valvular calcification surrounding structures are coronary arteries. Near the valve is a coronary artery origin, mitral valve, IV septum. And major clinical issues were coronary occlusion. You can occlude the coronary, patient will die on the table. Mitral valve injury, permanent AV block, stroke, aortic leak, processes migration. Processes will not stay because you're not stitching. And non-lasting results. So how he developed this? A balloon expandable stent with high radial force might keep the valve open. This was his thought process. A balloon expandable stent with high radial force will keep the valve open. And a valvular structure would have to be attached within the stent. A stent-like structure inside the valve where you have attached valvular-like structure. This was the hypothesis, a challenging combination of balloon expandable frame and the valve structure. This is the challenge at that time. So 1990, birth of the idea as a solution, the most challenging crazy concept and implanting a valve processor within a diseased aortic valve and it was almost impossible and dangerous surrounding structure. So regular observation was done during BV and then of course this was Washington Renu Virmani uh, that was a confirmatory finding later on. So after this they developed the valve which was height was 17. This is a coronary artery, right coronary ostium, left coronary ostium and the valve have to be implanted here. You have to give respect to the adjoining structure. These are all biological thought process comments. 1994, this was the thought process, till 1999. I was there in 96 to 98. He did not have a sponsor. He was just thinking, working, working, and working. He did not sponsor. Comments from the experts from all biomedical companies. When you do research, you do innovation, you have to have a sponsor. Without sponsor, you cannot do a original research. They said, totally unrealistic. Major technical issues, definitely impossible to stent a calcific aortic valve. Unavoidable life-threatening complications, stroke, MI, would never be approved by FDA, surgery covers 100% and most stupid project ever heard. This was in writing, Dr. Krivier got on mail by most of the company, including Edwards, including Edwards. Edwards was still making at that time surgical aortic valve. Most stupid project ever heard, just forget it. When he submitted the project to the companies who would sponsor a new project, this was the answer, end of the story. He said, okay, I don't have a sponsor, how to do it? So, forget it, opinion of experts, then they did not leave hopes. They founded their own company by the name of PVT, Percutaneous Valve Technologies, with the help of Martin Leon and S. Rove and Robin Vox and Martin Leon in USA. They finalized the device, tri-flight leaflet, bovine pericardial valve, stainless steel stent, diameter, and then, of course, cre creation of startup. This was a startup company. December 99 signed agreement with this Israel company, investment development from the Israel, and then this was a team. Request to all the engineers <coughs> to make a process made of highly resistant frame containing uni or tri people wall, able to be homogeneously compressed, enlarged by balloon inflation. This was a concept given to the engineers, and they designed the valve with this, with this thought process. Hemodynamic safety and durability, and they made it. This was PVT company, they made it. 
and triblepheled polymer bovine pericardium at that time stainless steel frame single diameter 23 mm crimped hemodynamics and then they had still the limitation thb implantation animal model they did in animals the same valve was used in animal fairly similar similar anatomy in sheep and pig but size of the heart aortic valve and proximity of the donor sister even minor difference in physiology and anatomy cannot lead to profound difference in treatment safety there was a the limitation with the deficiency in animal model there was no calcium when they were using this in animal model no aortic valve degeneration different arch anatomy this was the limitation when they were using it moving to human was the most difficult decision to make moving the same valve to the human being was difficult but finally they did it april 16 they did the first man first cardiogenic shock ef 20 12% very severely sick patient comorbidities and failed emergent transeptal bav it was failed that was back and he was back in shock in 24 hours this was a serious serious patient challenging decision of transeptal tavi as a life saving procedure all current contraindication of tavi was there and this was done and this was april 16 they did it and finally this is 30 minutes post implantation 8 days post implantation and feasibility of tavi was established no thcv embolization no coronary occlusion no mr no av heart block that means they at least confirmed that this is feasible and this was done and then it works they said valve positioning and this is you can see the eyes of the people who were uh, the lnl shanenoff the deputy the second in command at that time with alan krebier and christoph tron so these people did it and published in circulation and then after that there have been so many challenging the so many devices 2002 2005 the historically first case was 2002 and then till 2005 there were heroic period i i revive and recast trials and then compassionate use only so this heroic period the lot of patients 83 year old patient one year post our public uh, he was shown in tct meeting in usa then 83 year old 6.5 uh, years post our and patient 3 patient 10 so these are the heroic patients from 2002 to 2022 transeptal takes its flight to the world then after the french people then of course new york martin leon then patrick saras from rotterdam milano colombo from 2005 100 tavi were performed in year 2005 so this was the beginning and other the doctors take it took interest it was earlier known as cribier edward well because edward was for making company yeah i forgot to tell you edward company which had refused then bought pvt they bought pvt and then they became the owner of this valve cribier edward name was changed to edward sapien and now edward sapien so so these are the different technical logical designs then the surgeons enter the room and the surgeon said we'll do transapical and uh, this was being used in limited cases as of now uh, and so reason for success is there because of this so i'm not going to detail I have to finish my talk too soon so that we can go ahead with the second talk so live in box and then we will have dr dagobati can you please connect to the us uh, yes please connect to us how long will it take because we can take his talk before live in box so tavi a long bulky road 30 years since bavi bav 30 years 20 years since fim so it became after partner 1 2 and 3 trials it has been used vividly all over the world especially in usa and now in india we are doing many cases more than 1 million 1.5 million patients have been treated worldwide in more than 70 countries 15 lakh se zyada pe kya sab to 18 lakh ho gaya hua data is are not this is a little last year data who would believe that this a new paradigm tavi is conceived for patients who are not candidates for, you see very important slide this is very important just listen to this In 2002, TAVI should be done for patients who are not candidate for surgical aortic valve replacement. 2002, TAVI is conceived for patients who are not candidates for surgical aortic valve replacement. Now, what is it? 2002, surgical aortic valve is indicated in patients who are not candidates for TAVI. It's a paradigm shift in the indications of transcatheter aortic valve implantation. So, such a huge leap and paradigm shift in the indication of this. I would like to show you the first case report before I finish off. This was 83 year old 2011 I told you we did took this patient to out of India severe calcific stenosis valve area 0.7 83 year old male p gradient 85 mean gradient 65 ejection fraction maintained hypokaryes in lateral wall post bypass patient long diabetes mellitus graft patency status was there but one graft was already occluded poor lung function and nephropathy so these were all contraindication for 83 year old vip patient dr mani said i will not operate this patient because he has a high risk of dying post operatively or during the table because of very poor lung function he may not come out of ventilator so surgical consultation led to conclusion of high risk and we decided to do tavi we took do the lot of preparations mri mri in apollo hospital including mri of the heart 
uh, because he had nephropathy, we did not do contrast CT, and which confirmed the aortic annular size. CT NG was not performed. A uh, patient was treated successfully by Tavi in Rouen, France, in November 11, I think. Uh, we'll show the NGO clips. A few clips before we finish this lecture. This is how we open. This is the sheath, long sheath, Nova Flex going up. 18 French, Nova Flex, 18 French, now 14 French. As uh, of now, we used 14 French. And uh, this was uh, to cross the aortic valve. And uh, then uh, you do the balloon aortic valvuloplasty with a pigtail at the aortic root. This is a balloon aortic valvuloplasty to make a space for the purpose of putting the valve. And uh, Nova Flex sheet, Edward sheet, inside the lower flex growing up. <coughs> and this is the valve. So this is how the valve is going. This is Edward sapien valve. This is the how the valve is going. This is anti-grade approach, not, this is a retrograde approach. <laughs> and then after proper positioning, valve was deployed. This is how the valve was deployed. There's a mild aortic leak, which was there, but it was immediately, second day, it came, went down, normal. This is per close, the descending aorta, iliax, and then of course per close, we, went, we removed that. Patient was discharged the third day, patient went, came back, he didn't come, come back to India, he went for a European tour and he came back after 15 days to India and he lived for another, another at least uh, uh, nine years. He died recently because of kidney failure and we could not do the transplant. So this is how uh, the thought process of Alan Kribeer, which is translated from dream to reality. And, uh, and uh, then if I, uh, is Dr. Raju, uh, Dr. Ramesh ready there? Yes. Eh? Dr. Ramesh, is he online? So we can take a, uh, uh, I think we will, is he, is he watching us there? Ah, baat kar lije. I would like to show you one live inbox for five minutes and then we will go to his talk. Can you come to the laptop, somebody? This is a live inbox. Eh? Okay, so this is Dr. Ellen El Shaninov uh, with Dr. Ellen Krivier. Recently, I had to use this live inbox with the consent of Dr. P.C. Rath, which was done. Okay, Dr. Ramesh, you are there. I am just finishing off uh, my small. Uh, uh, a live in box for five minutes and then we will take you. This is the live in box which was done by Dr. Kribeer recently. So this is a patient. Uh, can we have the sound of this? Sound of uh, the laptop. 67 year old, systemic hypertension, diabetes mellitus, obesity. Can we have the sound of the laptop? I think I'm still connected, Dr. Gupta. They, they can have both the thing, I think. Let me just see. Yeah. So this is the, what uh, the echo showed, the aortic gradient, and then uh, these are the various... Uh, parameters which are taken before doing the procedure, including the CT and uh, this. And they have the plan to do sapien three valves adverts. So let me talk what they are doing, size 23, accessible right femoral artery from the excess. They have done the coronaries. And uh, Dr. Kribe is standing as the second operator, not the operator, but he's Actually, <coughs> we'll do the case initial, the workup is done by Dr. Ellen El Shaninov, who is now the chief of department of cardiology in Shal Nicole Hospital, Shal Nicole Rua. This is how they're crossing the valve. This is very important, tricky, because crossing the aortic valve sometimes takes a little more time. And uh, Dr. Kribir had a specific technique of crossing the valve earlier. And uh, once they have crossed the valve, then they will do the balloon aortic. They have already crossed the valve, I think. Uh,
Can you see it, Dr. Ramesh? Yeah, I can see. Yeah. Okay. Just for the purpose of recording and uh, now they are going to, going to do the balloon inflation. So this is balloon aortic valvoplasty to open the valve and then they will take the valve up and you deploy it just like a stent. So this is the valve which is going up and this is the valve which has crossed the ascending aorta now near the aortic valve. They will make a positioning of this. Now they have already deployed. So it's almost like a stent like procedure and uh, And there is hardly any aortic regurgitation post implantation. So, what they are doing is now closing it with a per close technique. This is a 14 French sheet, and they don't want to do a cut open. And this is again a non surgical closure of the valve, uh, sorry, of the aortic uh, this groin. So this is the procedure which I wanted to show. This is live in box. When you do live cases, you can use that as a live in box. And uh, now we move on to the America, USA. So, okay, thank you very much. Uh, can we have a doctor? Uh, huh? Okay, no, but okay. So we have now the next. Uh, now we have the next talk, uh, which is by Dr. Ramesh. Uh, please, can you further introduce yourself uh, for the interest of the audience and recording? Um, where are you working and how many years of experience? So many things because uh, Dr. Dagubati, MD, FAC, FSCI, he's working as a director, interim chief of cardiology, director of structural heart disease, West Virginia University, and is chair of Sky International Committee. Okay. So, yeah, we, thank, thank yeah. you, Dr. Gupta. Great yeah. pleasure to be with you today, and uh, I, I really enjoyed your lecture on uh, where we were with the TAVI and where we have come. Uh, it's my great pleasure to give you my topic, which is on tower challenges. So, as you mentioned, I'm the uh, interim chief of cardiology at the West Virginia University, and I've been uh, in practice since about uh, 1991 uh, from India. I trained in India, did my MD. And I came here, did my cardiology research in the Loma Linda Hospital in California. Uh, then I did again resident, residency and cardiology fellowship at uh, New York and uh, uh, Winthrop Hospital, which is part of NYU system now. And uh, interventional at uh, Yale uh, uh, New Haven Hospital at Bridgeport. So um, with that, uh, I do I, uh, further ado, I will go ahead and start what are the new challenges, uh, the new indications that are being looked at the bicuspid valves. And uh, we're starting our research on asymptomatic aortic stenosis and moderate aortic stenosis with heart failure. So as you know that there are 54 million in the United States are over the age of 65 that are all the eligible patients for that could either undergo TAVR or SAVR. And up to 7% of the population of the age of 65 have aortic stenosis. That's around 3.8 million people. And uh, between 1990 and 2020, the population from 65 to 74 years old increased to 74%. Right now, as you were talking earlier, the business for Edwards is about $0.6 billion, which is expected to grow to $1.6 billion by 2035. So there's a huge growth in tower. The guidelines recommend in severe aortic stenosis uh, with high gradients, obviously with a, a mean gradient of more than 40 or Vmax more than four meters per second and a valve area less than one. They're symptomatic stage one, and they should be evaluated and recommended for valve replacement. And uh, if they're not symptomatic, then they should undergo exercise stress test and then should be recommended for the stress test uh, for the tower. And uh, if there are a paradoxical low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis or a true low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, uh, if they have either increasing gradients by dobutamine or high calcium score 
on the CT scan still they could further uh, be evaluated by the team, uh, heart team approach and undergo SAVR or TAVR. And so this is how we uh, do in asymptomatic patients following up with the re a re a echocardiogram every six to 12 months is recommended. So all patients with severe valvular heart disease that should be considered valve, valve interventions. They need to be evaluated by multidisciplinary team. We do that every Wednesday about 30 of us get together, heart failure, interventional cardiologists, cardiac surgeons, and, uh, and uh, general cardiologists will all meet and decide what is the best for the patients. You know, though the recommendations as you mentioned are uh, still sour is recommended in younger people. Quickly, they are above 65. Most patients are uh, now being uh, looked at uh, whether they're candidates for a tower or not. But I think uh, rather than thinking that uh, this is a new kid on the block and everyone should get a tower, we should understand from the patient's viewpoint what is the lifetime management. Should you have sour or tower? And if you have sour, which uh, bioprosthetic valve do you get? We need to think about tower and uh, sour in the future. And uh, do you get a root enlargement? And uh, what do we do for younger patients? You know, in less than 65, should we do tower? Because or should we put a mechanical valve uh, as compared to a bioprosthetic valve? And uh, if you do a mechanical valve, obviously you can't do a tower in the future. You know, so that's what we need to think about that. What do we do for bicuspid valves when the root is not enlarged? And uh, so the valve durability appears to be the key for all these things. And uh, we still have a data only up to 10 years uh, that uh, uh, most patients have uh, had uh, uh, data only for 10 years with the tower and longevity has to be understood. I think whether rather than thinking tower versus tower, that is the wrong question. Will the patient be alive in 10 years? And is the patient durability more, uh, more important question? So is the valve going to outlast the patient or the patient is going to outlast the valve? Well, that's what we need to think about. And uh, so in the new framework for aortic uh, stenosis staging and LV damage has been proposed. Uh, and I think stage zero to stage four, if you have right heart damage, that is stage four and no damage is at stage zero in between is a slight left ventricular damage, left atrial or mitral damage and um, pulmonary or tricuspid damage is number three. And uh, so uh, early intervention, uh, as I said, the trials that are ongoing right now are uh, 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 tower unload and early tower. Uh, tower unload is asymptomatic severe, uh, uh, sorry, moderate aortic stenosis with uh, symptoms of heart failure and reduced ejection fraction is tower unload. And early tower is symptomatic, uh, asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis patients, whether they will have any uh, survival benefit with the tower in the future. So uh, this is a tower unload and uh, with, those were with the uh, sapien valves or uh, Edward sapien valves. And uh, these are with the uh, self-expanding valves and uh, uh, also expand the tower two is uh, the one that is looking at uh, uh, similar to the one with the balloon expandable valve in people with uh, heart failure uh, therapy. So the bicuspid I still think is a really a challenge for most of us and uh, not exclusively in younger patients uh, they are uh, uh, so far bicuspid uh, is excluded from randomized trials and they're younger, longer life expectancy and lower risk and uh, what is the durability in these patients. So there are three types of bicuspid severe on CVS classification, type 0 to type 2. Uh, type 0 is a very a few numbers in the registry and most of them are type 1 uh, bicuspid valves. When you look at partner three trial that uh, initially we thought, okay, death stroke or rehospitalization is uh, similar in uh, uh, bicuspid versus tricuspid, but the numbers are very small, about 148 patients in each arm. So they are matched and it looks good. You can twist the data however you want to support and saying that hey, bicuspid valves also do well. But as you see in this uh, uh, as treated population in the patient uh, up to two years, uh, tower and bicuspid versus surgery. So you can see that in tower, when the, there's valve thrombosis and uh, mean gradients are much uh, higher in people with the tower than with the surgery. About 53.8% mean gradient was uh, more than 20. And uh, you know, so these are the ones that are uh, transvalvular AR with no change in mean gradients was also higher with the tower than with surgery in uh, these types of patients. So I think uh, uh, pacemaker rates are also initial uh, with the initial data. This is the partner three. So we were already using the new generation Sapien uh, 3S3. And so this was much higher 
and uh, it will uh, uh, pacemaker was 7.3 percent versus 5.4 percent with surgery. And uh, so this is where we, I think, we need, we need to still make a difference and uh, understand the challenges of uh, tower. So here is a 79-year-old patient with critical aortic stenosis, class three dyspnea, and uh, had coronary artery disease that underwent PCI. SPS risk is 5.412. And mean gradient is 41, heavy calcium is bicuspid valve, and oversized annulus. And so these are all the high risk features and also has porcelain iota for which is not a candidate for uh, aortic valve surgery. So is uh, so you can see that the severe calcifications and the gradients are uh, more, and he was deemed to be inoperable by two surgeons. We don't need that now. We only need one surgeon to say uh, inoperability. So, so this is an off-level use of tower because of large annulus of nearly uh, yeah, as you can see, 813.9 square millimeters and a very uh, elliptical uh, and uh, one not a good patient uh, for uh, uh, any type of uh, intervention. But uh, he insisted on undergoing this procedure, so we did uh, a pre-implant balloon aortic valvuloplasty with an iotogram. So that helps us to understand in this patient if there is no uh, uh, contrast coming into the LV with the balloon implanted and doing an iotogram, that tells us that, okay, he's a good candidate and we can uh, seal, uh, uh, the uh, get a good seal with the, uh, with the tower valve. So then we proceeded actually in this patient with the, sorry, with the tower here, as you can see, uh, uh, implantation was not done and um, unfortunately it's not playing, I'll show it to you later. So there's no AI. So the, oh, though the annulus is large, we put 29, uh, C, uh, 29 valve of uh, S3 uh, plus another 5 cc of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, saline extra. And uh, so we got a good uh, tower uh, position, as you can see, about uh, 80, 20. And uh, there's no uh, central AI. And hemodynamics look great. And uh, as you can see, the pre-tower versus tower, the mean gradient came down to almost null. You know. So, and he was discharged 48 hours post implant uh, and he had only class one symptoms after one month. So I think uh, the optimal valve performance and the minimal interference with surrounding structures and simple predictable deployment, low complication rates and the low profile for transfemoral delivery and most importantly, durability of the, of the one is very important. I don't think there's one transcatheter valve uh, that is ideal for every patient in anatomy. We need to know balloon expandable, self-expanding and the newer types of valves as well. So still the structural valve degeneration in partner two randomized trial, actually a large number, 1430, it is slightly higher with the TAVI than with SAVR. But whereas the notion with a small number of patients, 280, it felt that the SAVR had also higher uh, 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 no, uh, structural valve degeneration. So this is where we have to understand where, where, which uh, uh, data do you believe in, or we do need uh, larger studies in the future. So think twice before tower in these patients, small annulus, bicuspid, valve in valve, low coronary heights, and very young patients and aortic aneurysms. I'll show you quickly. So this is a patient we were doing a tower, and uh, as you can see that uh, the valve uh, is going across with the uh, Edward Sapien valve. And there was something that actually you can see now in the arch, uh, a floating part of a piece of uh, atroma. I think that is there. So you need to make sure that there's nothing. So we didn't know what else can be done. It's already uh, over there in the ascending iota. So we had to take the risk. We went ahead and deployed it and uh, then took it out. So we saw, we saw this floating thing coming back into the descending iota as well. So then uh, as you can see, there's a, a occlusion of the femoral artery uh, whether that is from the perclos or from the atheroma, whichever occluded it. Two days later, patient had a agitation, so MRI was done, which showed multiple infarcts, and uh, that patient unfortunately passed away. So this is another 86-year-old. We were doing a valve in valve tower, and uh, the, as you can see, probably it's, uh, again, uh, keep an eye on this, and it is implanting, uh, sorry, that's a BAV, and uh, let me play this one. So this is a balloon that is expanding sapien XT valve at that time, a valve in valve. And uh, why the balloon is uh, a balloon ruptures uh, during the uh, expansion of the balloon uh, expandable valve, uh, but the balloon ruptured. So, but luckily we are already almost close to uh, complete uh, effacement with the valve in valve. 
So we didn't know what else could be done at that time. And uh, so we said, okay, uh, the patient looks good. So let's take it out. Unfortunately, while taking the, along with the vascular surgeon in the room, uh, it actually lacerated the entire uh, iotoiliac junctions. And uh, so this is what happened. So when the balloon ruptured, it transected in this patient rather than having a linear uh, thing, a linear tear. So this transection of the balloon and it is like an umbrella scraping the entire iota and the iliac artery. And so that patient actually had a huge bleed and died on the table. Uh, the, and the, so low coronary heights, uh, if you put in a valve in valve, uh, they're uh, definitely undergo left main occlusion in this patient. And uh, that is a, a terrible uh, thing to happen. And uh, uh, before you can do anything, the patient actually had a weak embarrassed and died, could not be resuscitated. In small annuli, uh, the problem is actually patient processes mismatch. And we know that all cause reintervention operation with the patient processes mismatch is much worse, uh, much higher than people without uh, a, any uh, pre existing or moderate PPM. So look for PPM, which is more than 20 millimeter gradients. Okay. This is, a, I want to quickly show two patients, similar data, and I'm now going, my cath lab is actually calling me, uh, hybrid or is calling me to do towers. Uh, we have three scheduled today. So 78 year old man with a severe aortic stenosis, V max of 4.5 meters per second. And uh, he has coronary artery disease, but the STS is 3.6, but he is deemed to be high risk for surgery because of liver cirrhosis and MELD score of 16. And uh, so, uh, here's uh, some data of this, and uh, so you can see that the uh, aortic valve is heavily calcified, mild AI, and uh, these are the gradients. And uh, the one thing I want to show you is the maximal ascending aortic diameter, and uh, the sinus of uh, valve salva are slightly larger. You know, he has a mild uh, aortic aneurysm, and I showed, I told you that about the uh, uh, aneurysm of uh, how we need to be careful. So. In this patient, uh, we did uh, a uh, self-expanding valve, but as you can see that uh, before we even implanted anything with the wire and uh, there was already appears to be some tear in the iota. So, but we went ahead and implanted the valve. And uh, so there is, as you can see the dissection in the, uh, in the ascending iota uh, from the root all the way into the descending iota and a massive dissection, but uh, uh, approximately it was sealed with the uh, with the uh, evolute valve, but unfortunately that patient uh, died, you know, so because of ex extensive dissection after four days. So this is a similar patient, same uh, same thing, 78, same age, same thing, everything looks same, by bicuspid valve, calcified, sevus uh, type 1, uh, annular area again is large, ascending iota again is 4.5 centimeters, and uh, he underwent robotic aortic valve replacement and uh, with the 25 avalus and extubated same day, he went home on day three. So, and he was doing well and last week. And so the, uh, in conclusion, I would say that uh, the challenges are uh, plenty, even though the new indications of TAVR are emerging and in asymptomatic and moderate AS, probably we'll be doing TAVR soon, but the challenges still remain to be by bicuspid, small annulus, low coronary heights, and uh, valve in valve TAVRs, durability, and uh, again, in pure aortic regurgitation as well. But uh, for pure AI, the newer uh, uh, you know, fourth generation tower valves will be probably very good uh, for Chenna valve and uh, the uh, M valve type of valves that are coming up soon. Okay. So meticulous imaging and anatomy tailored towards the uh, transcatheter heart valve selection seems mandatory in these patients. Okay. With that, I'll stop here. I'll be happy to take any questions at the end. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, am I audible to you? Yes, sir. I, you are. Yeah. Okay, okay. So it was a great presentation as usual. Uh, there are two questions which I come to my mind and Dr. Amit Munjal will also ask. Uh, you want to ask now? Okay. So Dr. Amit Munjal is an interventional cardiologist and working in Hisar, uh, which is uh, in Haryana and has come all the way to attend this meeting. So please go ahead. I can't. I can't hear your voice because the mic is not connected, I guess. Sir, how Thank important you. is the wall sizing to protect coronaries from occlusion, sir? Oh, it's a, absolutely a very good question. Dr. Thank you very much. This is very important. I think in low coronary heights, we always uh, try to, if the coronary height is more than 
10 millimeters, it is okay. But if it is less than 10 millimeters, it is better to protect uh, with a wire. And I always put a guide, either guide liner or guidezilla uh, into the coronary artery. I don't actually take a stent out yet. Uh, that is very important. And the sizing still, you know, you have to size appropriately to, uh, to the annulus. But the position of the valve, either if you go too high, then you'll have a higher risk of coronary occlusion. So even though now we like 80, 20, meaning 80 aortic and 20 ventricular, maybe in that patient with low coronary height, we come down to 60 aortic and 40% into the ventricle. So we come down. The risk of coming down into the ventricle is uh, uh, pacemaker uh, might be higher. You know, pacemaker rates will be higher. But uh, if the size, whether 23 or uh, uh, 29 or 26 valve, that depends upon the annulus, and I don't actually change it based on the coronary height. Okay, uh, there's a small uh, one. One patient came to me. I, I want to discuss a I thought challenging thought process. A young female, only 28, calcific aortic valve, but not heavy calcium, moderate. She is, says that she has been advised by a prosthetic valve because she wants to continue her at least childbearing age. And she understands that by prosthetic valve surgically will be need to be replaced after a few years. She comes to me that she, okay, I have heard about Tavi and you. So would you be able to do TAVI in my case? You said it's a relative contraindication, young patients, and that's true. Because once you are surgically planning to do bioprosthetic valve, how far we are correct in a moderately or mild calcified uh, aortic stenosis in young patients do TAVI and why not? If, if not, then why not? You understand my question? Yeah. I, I do understand, Dr. Gupta. So it's a very, uh, now, it's becoming a dilemma, uh, especially in countries like India and other places where uh, uh, obviously they can come and say that I have the money to pay for the valve, so why not you do it? You know, even recently, uh, I had to deny somebody uh, for the same similar patient in, uh, in Visakhapatnam uh, that I had to say no. Uh, because uh, the patient is actually much older than yours, you know, 55, and I said, it's, you're still very young, and uh, doing a TAVI in you might actually make me uh, do higher, another surgery, which is a higher risk. So uh, if you do this patient in 28 with the tower, when probably about 40 at the most, you, we might have to, or 45, we might have to do another surgery. So the number of... Uh, uh, valve surgeries that are being done now to take out a previously placed uh, tower valve are increasing according to the Society of Thoracic Surgery database in the United States. So if we do come across that uh, dilemma. Sometimes we thought, okay, this patient is not going, is young, but not going to survive more than 10 years. So let's do a tower. So that's why I said, is the patient going to survive the tower valve or the valve is going to survive longer than the, than the patient? If the valve is going to survive longer than the uh, patient, we should do a tower. But if the patient is going to survive longer than the tower, then the options are either redo tower or the first time surgery. So these are the things that we need to explain. And uh, you know, I think in my personal opinion, ethically, I would not uh, do a tower in a young patient and I would recommend her to have uh, surgery and uh, which actually will buy more time uh, even though, you know, Coumadin obviously is a concern for her uh, pregnancy, maybe she can wait. If it's only moderate aortic stenosis, we can wait. The other one actually is if she has severe aortic stenosis and she's 28 and has symptoms, I would uh, buy some time by doing a, a BAV. And uh, uh, recently, there have been case reports of where putting two 10 millimeter shockwave balloons, uh, peripheral balloons, and uh, doing a shockwave for the valve. And so that they can probably destroy some uh, 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 calcium and delay progression of the valve. Uh, that means uh, you mean to say we do bioprosthetic surgical valve at 28 and then plan for radio surgery after 10 years. That will be better than doing a TAVI now and doing a surgery later on? Yeah, so if you're doing surgery uh, bioprosthetic valve now at 28, then you can do a TAVR. Uh, the second time, uh, which will be 10, 15 years, hopefully, 
use a good uh, bioprosthetic valve, not a trifecta. Trifecta is really if we do tie -wee, fast. if we would if we do tie now, will it be difficult to do a surgery after five years, ten years? Slightly, yes. You need to choose a good surgeon, so it is not easy. And Tavi in Tavi at that place, maybe after 10 years, we have better valves? We probably will have better valves and the longevity might be, durability might be much higher. Yeah, but can we do Tavi in Tavi? I mean, valve in valve, in a Tavi valve? Yes. Yeah, I have done it. And, uh, you know, people who had 80 years of age, uh, they had gotten a Tavi and then they came back at uh, 87. Seven years later, actually, this is the original S, S, uh, the sapient valve. And at 87, we put in uh, another stake in uh, S3. So uh, that, uh, in fact, if somebody can pay, the why not TAVI now, even at 28, and do TAVI again after eight years? And then after that, you, she might still need a surgery at uh, 55 <laughs> or 65. By that time, who knows, you have a better valves, which will last for 15, 20 years more. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, yes. so it's a questionable thing. Uh, okay, so thank you very much uh, for this discussion and talk. and. Uh, uh, we thank you for your presence and sometime we we'll meet you. physically and uh, maybe in uh, next maybe Europe PCR or uh, something like that and we'll have your talk and further collaboration. Thank you. Thank you very much Dr. Gupta. Mm -hmm. I appreciate all the help. Okay, so we uh, finished this talk and now uh, in the, this uh, scientific program we have uh, Dr. Devi Shetty but uh, he's still not connected so maybe we invite Dr. Girish Tyagi who is our friend from uh, uh, from uh, Various, uh, he's a, a basically a physician and uh, from Delhi, and he will talk about the uh, very important topic: medical legal issues in clinical practice. He's been secretary DMA, Delhi Medical Association. So, can we please uh, request Dr. Girish Tyagi to be on the dais and do this presentation? Uh, do you have some slides, sir? Okay, okay, okay. So he's extempore uh, speaker, and he will speak. Uh, for 10 minutes regarding uh, medical legal aspects in clinical practice. Thank you, Dr. Vivek. And first of all, I am a secretary of Delhi Medical Council, not Delhi Medical Association. I was the past president of Delhi Medical Association, but uh, at present I am the secretary the um, registrar of Delhi Medical Council, and we receive complaints against the doctor for professional misconduct and medical against, against them. If the doctor is practicing in Delhi, whether then, of course, ultimately, the, whether the complaint is being filed at a PMO level or at a state health minister, level, ultimately, it will come to the Delhi Medical Council for adjudication. And we receive around 35 to 40 complaints per month. That means one to two complaints per day we are receiving uh, against the doctors. So I will be just uh, talking on that uh, these uh, litigation, uh, how the, why the litigation is against the doctor and uh, how we can reduce the litigation. Of course, uh, we cannot prevent the litigation against the doctors, but uh, we can reduce the litigation against the doctor. So why is the litigation against the doctor? So in my own terminology, I have a, a B, C, D, E, F. A stands for adverse outcome or an event. B stands for behavior. C stands, C stands for communication. And C also stands for comments for, of other colleagues. D stands for doctor-patient relationship. And D also stands for decision-making non relevant E stands for expectation of the patient. F stands for financial part. I'll just uh, come one by one. A is the adverse outcome or an event. Whenever the, in current scenario, whenever there is a adverse outcome or an event or likelihood of adverse outcome event, be prepared that uh, litigation will be filed against the doctor or the nursing home or the hospital. B is the behavior. Behavior is very very important. If the patient uh, patient himself or his relative or uh, are not satisfied the behavior of concerned doctor, not only the doctor, behavior of all the persons who are involved in the treatment of that particular patient, be the doctor, be the nurse, be the nursing trolley, be the nursing orderly or dietitian, physiotherapist, etc. If they are not satisfied the behavior of that particular uh, person who is involved in the treatment of their care, they, they are going li likelihood that they will file a complaint against that. And C is that communication. Communication is very, very important because uh, in our times, the communication was not part of the curriculum. We are not told about that, uh, how to disclose the death or to the bad news to the patient or to the relatives. And now, after, say, meeting with the State Medical Council of India at various levels and with the Health Ministry, now that has been part of the curriculum. And communication is very, very important. And comments of other colleagues is important from the point of view that we at Delhi Medical Council, we found that it uh, it is uh, unfortunate that uh, in 
at least 45 to 50 percent of the complaint there is a doctor behind that complaint who is pursuing the complaint and to file that complaint who is providing uh, literature etc to that uh, complainant to and pursuing him not to withdraw that complaint that is the very unfortunate part and d is the doctor patient relationship in earlier times the doctor patient relationship was supposed to be a pious relationship based on the faith and trust now after the imposition of the consumer protection act mainly in 1986 now they they they, they thought that doctor is being equated with that so this provider and patient is being just himself think himself to a consumer itself so after that uh, 1986 of consumer protection act now the uh, there is a influx of complaints lodged against the doctors for that matters and d also stands for decision making now it is the patients are the weird one they are coming with that uh, through the google or after going through the uh, talking uh, talking or discussion with the patient or uh, or relatives of uh, friends who might be doctor they want themselves to be involved in the decision making if you are not involving the patient or the relatives in that decision making then of course the likelihood that if the uh, results are not satisfactory to the tune of the patient the li likelihood that they will file a complaint so decision making involvement is very very important in nowadays e is the expectations or perception of the patient expectations that means the results of expectation from the patient point of view suppose the patient is of a stroke is admitted under a neurologist under a qualified neurologist neurologist so once they are admitted and a qualified person at a at a good center they thought they have a apprehension that once they are admitted automatically they will be okay with the no side effect with no complication and so so from, from the neurologist point of view patient might be recovering okay patient might be recovering smoothly but from that not from the patient or the relative point of view they thought that once they are admitted under the neurologist after one week or so they will just go to to the uh, at their normal level which of course they they, they are running walking etc which of course it is not possible so f stands for financial financial means ki this generally implies to that private sector so if they are paying to that doctor to the nursing home or to the hospital and they are not getting the desired result then they are likelihood that they will file a complaint against the doctor so f stands for financial mostly in the private sector so in current scenario what are the options available to that patient or to the relatives about that uh, how they can go against the doctors so there are various option for uh, Uh, for the patient or the relative they can go to the consumer court consumer court for compensation they can also go to the civil court for against for the, again for the compensation they can go to the criminal court once they thought that uh, doctor has done enough negligence or they have uh, some enough evidences to prove that uh, negligence is so great that uh, they want doctor should be behind the bar sometimes it is seen that they go and approach that uh, police station or the criminal court to file a uh, fire against the doctor so and they can go directly to the high court under article 226 or under article 332 they can go directly to the supreme court of the police or that uh, lower courts are not apparent. and they can also go to the national human rights commission directly because we are receiving a uh, uh, number of complaints from the national human rights commission also directly they can go to the state medical council or national medical commission or if their uh, patient or relative feel that there is uh, some violation of state acts or central acts like uh, biomedical waste act uh, nursing home act or uh, transplantation act or uh, various acts uh, applicable pcp and dt act or mtp act if there is any violation they can go file to that relevant authorities for that and our unfortunate part of these are other seven options seven to eight options that criminal court consumer court civil court high court supreme court state medical council national medical commission they are approaching all the four are simultaneously that means once a complaint is being filed it is filed at all the fora that means the poor doctor has to reply to that all the fora at different room at delhi medical council we have discussed and uh, asked that uh, representation to that health ministry also that once a let the patient or the relative decide whether they want compensation they could go to the consumer court if they want that patient should uh, the doctor should be jailed they can go to the criminal court but they should not approach the all the fora simultaneously but of course uh, because of populistic or any other measure the, 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 they are uh, free to approach any fora and most probably they are approaching all the fora simultaneously that means ki once a complaint is being filed that means one negligence doctor has to uh, reply to appear or to at different fora simultaneously 
then how can we reduce that litigation? Of course, I have told you, told you that uh, we cannot prevent the litigation at the current scenario. But of course, we can reduce the litigation against the, us for the, uh, professional misconduct and negligence. Here also A, B, C, D, E. A stands for availability, B stands for behavior, C stands for communication, and D stands for documentation, and E stands for empathy. Availability, A stands for availability, that means ki when the patient or the relative reaches that, that uh, critical care at the nursing home or the hospital or at a clinic, the doctor availability of all the four M's, that means manpower, machine, method, material, all 